Women from Newfoundland and Labrador were not allowed to enlist in the armed forces during the First World War, but they could still serve overseas as nurses. Their work was physically and emotionally draining. They spent long hours in crowded and chaotic hospitals treating severely wounded soldiers from the front lines. Pain, misery, and death became a part of daily life for the wartime nurses. Maisie Parsons saw it often enough in battlefield hospitals at Belgium, Egypt, and Greece. War-torn places that were far flung from her hometown of Harbour Grace, a fishing community on Newfoundland's Avalon Peninsula. Parsons had graduated from the General Hospital's School of Nursing at St. John's. After the war broke out, she joined the Canadian Army Medical Corps. Nurse Frances Cron was another graduate of the General Hospital who served overseas. She worked aboard a hospital ship named the Carisbrook Castle. It crisscrossed the English Channel, picking up wounded soldiers from French ports and bringing them back to England for treatment. It was dangerous work. German U-boats prowled the English Channel and would torpedo any Allied vessel. Mines were another threat. About 20 hospital ships sank during the First World War. But not all of the Newfoundland and Labrador women who served overseas were professional nurses like Parsons and Cron. Many of them were VADs. They belonged to the Voluntary Aid Detachment. It was a league of semi-trained nurses who performed a wide range of medical services. They volunteered as hospital cooks, clerks, and maids. They assisted at operations, they cared for patients, and they drove ambulances. Basically, the VADs did whatever they could to lessen the workload of the professional nurses they served alongside. VADs had to complete several weeks of training before entering service. They took courses in first aid, home nursing, and hygiene. They also volunteered in local hospitals, and open-air drills taught them how to pitch hospital tents, care for wounded soldiers, and how to build and cook on campfires. Frances Cluett volunteered as a VAD in the First World War. She wrote about her training in letters to her family in Ballorum, Fortune Bay. Miss Janes and I went to Dr. Burden's last Tuesday night to be examined on first aid and home nursing. The both of us passed. He asked us quite a few questions. Miss Janes was supposed to have a broken collarbone and a severe bleeding from the palm of the hand which could not be stopped. I, of course, had to treat it. He then asked me how I could change an undersheet for a person who was very ill. He then asked me what I would do in a case of diphtheria, what disinfectants I would use, and how strong to use them. I had to read the clinical thermometer and treat a case of poisoning. He asked me how to make a linseed meal poultice, etc. He asked me a good many questions. After he told us we passed, you can imagine how light we felt. Newfoundland and Labrador sent its first contingent of five VADs overseas in November 1915. By the end of the war, about 40 had left the island. Most served in Europe's overworked war hospitals. They cleaned wards, sterilized medical equipment, bandaged wounds, bathed patients, prepared their meals, and made their beds. If patients were too wounded to hold a pen or a book, then the VADs read aloud to them and wrote their letters home. The women also watched over the dying soldiers. Later, they prepared the bodies for the mortuary. Sybil Johnson described her experiences in the many letters she sent to her family in St. John's. She worked in a military hospital near Liverpool during the war. Fairbank came in again as a patient. His leg has gone wrong. He was so hearty and glad to be back, poor old thing. I always liked him. One always feels when people really are sincerely friendly, I think. Fairbank's right arm is off, just below the elbow, and is still wrong, and he may lose the joint. And his right leg can hardly be saved, and he has a wife and a couple of kids, and is so fond of them all, and worries about what will happen if he loses his right leg as well as his arm. It would be so awkward for crutches. He is a white-faced man and looks so miserable. How he keeps so witty and outwardly cheery, I know not. The work took a heavy emotional toll on all of the VADs. Most of the women came from sheltered, middle-class homes. Now they had to receive convoy after convoy of badly wounded soldiers, men who arrived with severed limbs, gunshot wounds, and countless other injuries. Some patients would never heal. The VADs could only ease their pain while waiting for them to die. The last few days have been awful. Poor old Sergeant McDee, a Nova Scotian soldier, elderly, had his leg off. 
I was on alone with the head sister when he came back from op, and all the next day alone as the other bad had her whole day off. He had a horrible dressing, and the drum was so tightly packed that it was almost impossible to get the gauze, etc., out with our old blunt lifter. The sight and sound of his pain was so awful that once, when I went to the bathroom with a tray full of dressings, I found myself panting and had to lean against the wall. Then I remember that every second of waiting meant pain for him. Day after day, the nurses cared for men whose bodies and minds had been shattered by the war. The sadness was often inescapable. It was even worse for the nurses who had relatives on the front lines, a horrible reminder of the dangers their loved ones faced. Poor Sister George is very upset because they have found the body, or grave, of her brother who was missing last year. Though they had given up hope, apparently, and his will was published in the papers, this when I was in A last summer, I suppose they couldn't feel certain that there wasn't a gleam of hope of his return. Now, of course, it is Finney. I am awfully sorry for them. If he is like her, he must have been splendid. Janet Miller Eyre also lost loved ones during the war. She was originally from St. John's and she served as a VAD in Scotland. That's where she married Captain Eric Eyre of the Newfoundland Regiment. The union only lasted for about a year. Eric was one of the many soldiers killed at the Battle of Beaumont Hamel on July 1, 1916. One year later, Janet's only brother, Andrew, died of pneumonia in a hospital in London after spending 16 months in the trenches. Janet stayed overseas until the war ended, and then she returned to Newfoundland. Frances Cluett also lost her cousin. Lieutenant Vincent Cluett of the Newfoundland Regiment was 21 years old when he died at the Battle of Cambrai in France on November 26, 1917. Last Saturday night, I was at Newfoundland headquarters in Rouen, making inquiries about him. Sergeant Dooling from St. John's told me that his people would probably hear of his death on Monday night. And did they hear on Monday night, Mother? He used to write me such long letters describing everything, and of course I used to write some very funny things to him. But never again. The Newfoundland Regiment is getting served pretty badly. In the last attack, nearly all the officers were killed. While I was talking to Sergeant Dooling, the phone rang, which told him of more deaths of our boys. He says our boys are getting caught up altogether. Sometimes the nurses were thankful that their work kept them so busy. The hospitals were chronically understaffed and forever overflowing with the wounded soldiers who poured in from the front lines. The VADs worked long hours with little time off. They had one half day off each week and one full day off each month. Francis Cluett worked 12-hour shifts in France. Night duty is no laughing matter, especially if the wards are heavy. I have the care of five wards at night, so you can imagine I am kept a bit busy. I sometimes feel very sleepy around the hours of one and two, but sleep must be sacrificed by all accounts, as one must keep a lookout for all sorts of things, such as amputation, bleedings, deaths, drinks, etc. This is a very wicked world, Mother. You cannot realize what sufferings there are. Some of the misery will ever live in my memory. It seems to me now as though I shall always have sad sights in my eyes. It was little different in England, where Sybil Johnson struggled to keep up with her ever-expanding workload. We are really like a clearing station. A convoy comes in and is sent out again in two days, except a few who are kept for ops. Then we have a fresh lot of names and diets to remember, and the bed-making and stripping again are incessant. I haven't been outside the grounds excepting a few trips to the village for ages. Come off duty and lie in my bed and sleep or read. Today I have a great longing on me to run away from ugly sights and the sounds of pain and the constant strain of being responsible for so many things. The work was traumatic, but it also gave the VADs and the professional nurses who went overseas a deep sense of satisfaction and accomplishment. In a time when women's roles were firmly planted in the domestic sphere, they had made significant and very public contributions to the war effort. They had also worked within a matriarchal hierarchy, a rare occurrence in the early 20th century world. When the war ended, many of the women found it difficult to readjust to the sheltered lifestyles that awaited them at home. They were frustrated because their families and communities expected them to return to their domestic roles. 
but the war had given them a newfound sense of independence and self-reliance. In the coming years, many of the same women who had worked overseas decided to join a new battle at home to win voting rights for women. Former VADs like Janet Miller Eyre now became leaders of the suffrage movement. Their hard work ended in success in 1925 when the Newfoundland legislature passed a franchise bill and women finally claimed their right to vote and run for political office. Music